I'd like to welcome our guest today, Zhuja Shishtu. <laughs> 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 enjoyed this episode of Scientifically Beautiful, which is on the Life is Tough, but you can be tougher network. She's led the country of Hungary uh, in numerous ways, not just in professional sports, but also as a journalist, also as a spokesperson for other women and other athletes. So we're going to talk about how even though to the world she's this beautiful, amazing woman, it has been tough to go through the things that she's gone through. And we're also going to talk about her health and wellness and how important it is and how she has gotten to where she is by the support from others as well as her internal drive. So thank you so much, Zhuja, for being on the call and the podcast. I can't wait to ask you questions. How are you doing today? Karam, it's really an honor to join you uh, on this podcast. And actually, it's been so nice that you have all the things that you have been telling Oh, wow. I'm really honored. <laughs> uh, it's fantastic to talk to you. And, uh, you know, it's uh, been uh, a couple of years that we know each other. And I'm really, really, really grateful that we had a chance to meet because I think it's so important when you actually have the feeling that you find a soulmate, someone who has got the same sort of drive to things and the same, uh, you know, priorities uh, to be a mother. And in the same time, someone who loves her profession. I met you um, a couple of years ago, actually more than a couple of years ago, but I think I met you in Hungary, but then I started thinking and maybe it was Austria because I met your husband as well. He's a doctor. And I was working uh, in the field of health and nutrition. He was as well. Um, he has, uh, he's almost, well, he is. He's a famous doctor in, in your country and in Europe and Eastern Europe. Um, and I will have the opportunity, hopefully, to be able to do a podcast with him as well. Um, but I was amazed when I met you. And, um, and then you probably don't know this, but people shared with me magazines that had you on the cover of them. Um, you did not share that with me. I had no idea. So I, I want to start with this. I wish, you know, when I met you, I just liked you instantly. And I thought you were his wife. And so I just was impressed at how you held yourself, how you presented yourself, the way that you acted and treated others. I would never have known you were famous or had been a child athlete um, and had all that attention. Honestly, I would never have known. I, you just did not uh, act like you had any, um, I think you, you didn't act arrogant at all. You just acted confident, which I really respected about you. So I want to start and give the audience uh, the ability before we get into um, even more of the podcast to know a little bit about you. We are going to talk about you as a wife and a mother, but I'd like for you to go back and share with us your childhood and who you are and what you did. And then, of course, if you want to share things about how hard it was, that's something we would love to hear too, but I'll be asking those questions anyway. So if you could just start with really telling us about yourself, I know everyone's going to be extremely interested. The path to my life uh, is is gymnastics and and you know uh, high profile uh, sport. Uh, when I was five, <laughs> that's basically when I started gymnastics, and it was basically a way that I wanted to do gymnastics. I was very energetic, very flexible. Uh, my mother was a ballet dancer. She also did some gymnastics, but uh, uh, I would say there was no other choice for my parents but to take me to gymnastics because I was doing all these flips around and I was almost like dangerous you know for my uh, kindergarten mates so they said okay it's better if she if we put her into the gymnastics you know uh, the gym and then she can do whatever she she like so basically I really felt that this was my environment the place where I should be and of course uh, gymnastics we know all that you know and especially American gymnasts are so famous Simona Biles I mean she is now the current number one star in gymnastics I really wonder how she's going to accomplish even higher goals in, in the Tokyo Olympics. Uh, but in my time, uh, you know, uh, Eastern Europe and Hungary was also in the top uh, 10, the top six of the world. So I think it was a good school. It was a very good uh, environment to be in, you know, good coaches. But, you know, when you really started realizing that this is something more than a 
everyday play, you know, that we can play around and we can do some flip-flops and, you know, just cartwheels. It was about the age of 14, 15, you know, when uh, uh, the, the junior membership of the national team uh, become reality. And then by this time, we were, I would say, practicing two times, three to four hours a day, almost seven, eight hours per day, six days a week. Wow. How <laughs> old were you? How I, old I were was, you, I was, about, I was 14, 15, something like that. So I just finishing elementary school, starting high school, basically. Uh, and you know what? You, you really had to decide when it was getting really tough, <laughs> What, what is the next step to give up or, or to, to keep going and to, to uh, you know, move forward uh, to my goal, which would be, of course, participating in an Olympic Games. Uh, and I also have to tell you, because, you know, uh, our listeners might not be aware of, of that, I would say, era uh, back in the 80s when I was doing gymnastics, you know, uh, in a politically so socialist country. Uh, you know, there was a big, you know, uh, division between the two worlds, the Western world and the Eastern world. So, for example, there was a huge, uh, I would say, uh, a real, real uh, uh, athletic tragedy, I should say, in my life. The 1984 Olympics, which was in Los Angeles, which was I, I was supposed to be a part of the Hungarian national team. But because of the political situation, uh, you know, uh, the socialist bloc, which Hungary belonged to back then, boycotted the Olympic Games, uh, which, which was, which was I, I still remember the day when I was standing on the top of the beam and listening, the radio, listening to the radio uh, when, you know, the anchor was actually announcing uh, the decision of the political leaders that Hungary, you know, joining uh, the Soviet Union is going to, you know, just withhold from the Olympic game and stay, uh, you know, away from the Olympics. And we were really, really you know, uh, making a very huge efforts to 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 actually uh, be in the best shape ever in our life, and 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 when politics steps in, I this today, you know, it's 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 also very difficult, and and for me, it's very very saddening to see how how. Uh, Sometimes and also in, in some part of the of that the, the Tokyo Olympics is also uh, I would say has to face this kind of burden, this kind of difficulty because of the you know the uh, the I would say the effect of the pandemic. I really hope that this Olympic Games, even though it's going to be now without spectators, this is going to be actually you know uh, I would say in a bubble without any spectator. But I still. Uh, would believe that at least for the sake of the the, the athletes, you know, uh, it would be an, an Olympic Games that at least goes through. Because I can I can really remember uh, what a what a real tragedy uh, it it feels for an athlete. But an outside reason, you know, people making decisions, you know, behind your behind your back uh, and above you can can really affect your life. So this was one of one of the, the toughest point of my life, but uh, I kept on doing gymnastics. Uh, and uh, of course, I went to high school and uh, yeah. my parents were fantastic people, uh, helped me to 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 come over on this this uh, sort of uh, uh, really uh, uh, difficult period. Uh, so I, I had, uh, you know, my uh, uh, high school uh, uh, graduation and then uh, I was uh, I was really hoping to be a part of the national team for the Seoul Olympic Games in 1988, which I actually made uh, to be a part of the Hungarian national team. Uh, besides that, you know, I also participated in world championships in Rotterdam, European championships, which I, I you know, uh, finished in the first sixth and seventh. So the, the top, the top ten or always the top eight, the top six uh, uh, from, from Hungary and also internationally. But the Olympic Games, this is, this is the goal of a professional athlete. You know, this is something that you really want to be a part of. So uh, especially with, with that sort of uh, uh, disappointment from four, four years before, of course, it was the, the greatest dream to be there in Seoul. And I made it. And I finished in the eighth place in the Seoul Olympic Games, which was which was a fantastic experience. 
And, uh, and after all these difficult years, I think it was not just for me, of course, but for the whole uh, athletic world, it was the, probably the first, uh, I would say, real relief after two boycotted Olympic Games, be because Los Angeles was the second one, uh, yeah. four years even before that in, in Moscow, uh, the, the, the Western world, uh, you know, uh, we told them, then they didn't participate. So I would say it was real, finally, the time you know, when, when uh, uh, you know, a melting pot uh, came together and you could feel that kind of, that kind of uh, a real special atmosphere of the Olympic Games, which is not a world championships, which is not, I would say, you know, a, a big world event, but an Olympic Games so when you can meet some other athletes, when you can cheer for some others, when you can really feel that that's an, a huge international, uh, you know, uh, global event uh, of, of the sporting world. Of course, many things has changed, uh, unfortunately, since so I would say, you know, the, the, the business uh, uh, viewpoints and of course the finances and and many aspects of of sport uh, uh, has has been changing a lot and I'm not even saying that this is a very nice way how sport is evolving in this kind of uh, um, you know under this kind of circumstances so but you have to understand of course that that this is I would say one of the the biggest uh, area of the of the of the whole entertainment business worldwide. Sport is probably one of the biggest business of of the whole entertainment uh, world. Uh, so, after the Olympic Games, uh, it was a very uh, special opportunity that that came across to my life. Uh, as I said, we were still just coming out of uh, of the of the of the socialist. Uh, regime, you know, basically opening up uh, to the West, you know, uh, Hungary was uh, going through, uh, you know, a democratic uh, um, a change. Uh, so in 1989, one year after the Seoul Olympic Games, basically Hungary became a free country again, which, which uh, gave the opportunity uh, for me as well uh, to to sort of open up my my uh, view and there this uh, fantastic opportunity came uh, from the university of minnesota uh, to earn a university scholarship through gymnastics wow. uh, which was something absolutely unimaginable you know before for someone coming be, from behind the iron curtain, you know, someone right. coming from the socialist countries, that was absolutely no way uh, to earn a, a scholarship, you know, in a Western country, especially not in the United States. So, uh, but I tell you, you know, nobody really believes and understands today that that was the era, I would say, you know, the pre-mobile era. <laughs> there was no yeah. mobile telephone, there was no communications like we are talking today. There was right. only writing letters and, and the classical telephone calls. So even to, to make the first steps and to, to organize and make a decision as a member of the Hungarian national gymnastics team uh, to leave uh, you know, my uh, country behind and go and move to another continent and to be a university student in a completely new country, it was not just a culture shock, of course it was, but it, besides that, it was, it was, I would say, a challenge that I could never imagine, you know, how, how it really will uh, become reality when I go there. So uh, it was actually a very difficult decision. Of course, it was a great opportunity, but um, I was really afraid to take it, but I took it. <laughs> so I, I, I decided to be a part of the University of Minnesota gymnastics team. And uh, that gave me the opportunity to start uh, studying there uh, as a, you know, and majoring in international communications and broadcasting and that's basically when my life uh, you know started to to um, I would say uh, melt into the area where I'm uh, at now ever since this is basically journalism broadcasting and sports and of course ever since many 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 other things but uh, uh, the major uh, structure of, of my career was basically a communication and journalism well, that so that led you from what I've understood and what people have told me, and, and you've shared a little bit to become a journalist and to be in the whole TV world. And you were, and I know this because I've been to Hungary numerous times and I've been around people in your country. 
you became a celebrity um, in your country. Um, and we've shared that, you know, you, you actually shared with me, I didn't know this, but that the country of Hungary uh, will compensate their Olympic athletes um, because they want them to be there and they want to support them, which I actually love. And I, I don't know of every country is like that, but it was interesting. You had that support, but yet you were driven to do all these other things. So I'd love to hear how you took your hard work and success as an Olympic athlete and moved it into another world because you know I think in life when life is tough and life is hard one of the things that people that are tougher than the bad things you know uh, they, they take a step forward and they recreate themselves are they they don't feel sad or maybe they do feel sad for a while I know that when I've made changes in my life it, it's sad to leave things but if you can look forward to a, a brighter future that's a very positive, good trait. And that's something I've noticed in you, Zhuja. You are always looking for the ability to make another positive impact. So I'd love to hear how you transitioned, you know, and you shared with us that you went to another continent. I can't even imagine how hard that was. I, I did not speak the language and to go and then have to, you know, transition to another world because especially from a world that's a communist, you know, country into a Western world, I know it was very hard. Um, but I'd love to hear how you went back to your country and then made a further uh, transition to become a leader in a different way for the country of Hungary. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, it was it was really a difficult decision because as you say, you know, I, I could have been, uh, you know, someone who, who stays in gymnastics, becomes a coach. And of course, I really had a lot of experience, which I uh, could have, you know, passed over to a next generation as a coach and, and stay in gymnastics, uh, maybe to become a judge, which I, of course, I never really loved gymnastics. It was always, you know, for uh, the, the, the number one love in my life for many years. But uh, I always had the feeling that I, I have some other, other focuses, uh, which is mostly about, as I said, communication and it was fantastic to to uh, to actually take a step towards a direction which was absolutely unknown to be the very first woman on sports television in Hungary. There was no women before me on TV uh, in sport programs at all. So How was uh, that, Zhuzha? I don't mean to cut you off. I didn't know that. So what was that like? Did, were there some people that weren't nice about it? I, I'm scary. sure. Yeah. I tell you, it was scary, really. Uh, you know, at the beginning when I was, you know, uh, I, I always, I, I would say I just right jumped off my gymnastics gear and starting working on television. Of course, it was not, not as, uh, as quick because in the same time I was studying broadcasting in the United States. So I had some, some university studies, but to do it in your own language, back in your country where there is no history of, of uh, you know, uh, having women on TV in sports, of course, it was a really, uh, I would say, bright step in that sense. Yeah. And uh, at the beginning, the most, uh, but until I was just co-commentating on gymnastics, maybe doing some rhythmic gymnastics, doing some figure skating, you know, some artistic sports, I think the audience would say, okay, I mean, we can accept her in these fields because, I mean, she's coming from, uh, you know, Olympic gymnastics. They knew me as an Olympic athlete, of course. So I had some, some background which helped me uh, to start the job, but... On the first days when I started anchoring sports news about other sports, especially when I started talking about football, telling football results, people were saying, oh my God, I mean, what <laughs> is she thinking about herself? I mean, who is she? How dare she? How can? I mean, this is outrageous that she's talking about football and basketball and tennis. I mean, a woman would be never credible. I mean, a woman's voice come on so <laughs> those things were the real the real obstacles the absolutely uh, you know uh, i would say uh, it, it was it was such a demanding uh, daily work to try to make people uh, believe that a woman can be credible in a field of sports no matter what sport we are talking about especially with 20 years of competitive you know sports behind her uh, so stereotypes 
uh, all kinds of all kinds of you know uh, uh, mm, you know it's just the the way how they looked at you sometimes standing next to a, a football field you know you you felt like you you should get out of there so <laughs> Uh, so I tell you, I had a lot of nights, you know, cried over, you know, and uh, it was it was very difficult at the very beginning. Uh, I really and then I would say in that sense, I was a pioneer to to stay on the field and not to quit yeah. and not to say, OK, guys, are you all right? I mean, I shouldn't be the one who tries to to make you understand that a woman can do it uh, in a credible and and and, uh, uh, you know, in a well done way. Uh, so what I, I believe that the only, only solution would be to be hundred percent prepared, you know, that I have to be always, uh, on the spot. I, I should be, uh, you know, always, uh, uh, uh you know, the, the knowledge, the knowledge is something that you have to be hundred percent sure about. Uh, and of course, of course, the data and all the, all the information you have to have, uh, because if you if you're not uh, you, if you cannot be questioned in that sense, and of course, sooner or later they will maybe experience that you are not as uh, you know maybe maybe she's talking okay maybe she, her questions are appropriate maybe her questions are adequate maybe she is she has some sense of sport maybe okay well you know we're not used to it but. Uh, which was also very important for me that I never wanted to be smarter than those who were coming from, for example, these very uh, traditionally men feel like football, basketball, some other, you know, uh, ball sports. I always just wanted to be on, on the edge of as an ex-athlete who is interested in people. And I think uh, as soon as I sort of find this kind of attitude, uh, people started accepting me in this field, but it, it took yeah. quite many years. And uh, as I said, I started working on the Hungarian National TV's uh, sports department in 1992 on the uh, Barcelona Olympic Games. Actually, this was my first job, which was quite big to do as a co-commentator in gymnastics. And then uh, in, um, in 1998, so six years later, I was uh, basically the prime anchor of the of the football World Cup in France. Six, oh, wow. only six years later, so it, in six years I could make this kind of transition from zero to be accepted in a field which was never even taken by a woman at all before. That's amazing. I actually didn't know that. I didn't know that you were the first female commentator. That's amazing, and you still are doing this with the Olympics even this year, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Actually, now for a couple of many years by now, I'm I'm a freelancer because I've been working in national TV and I've been working in commercial station. I've been working on on uh, uh, just sports channels, you know, uh, purely sports uh, like ESPN or something, but in Hungary, it's called the DigiSport for many years. I was actually the, the very first anchor of uh, and, and the sports commentator of that uh, TV station. Uh, when they were establishing it uh, and the last couple of years uh, and it uh, also has something to do with or uh, uh, I would say work together there's so many things that I'm interested in and as a matter I'm also focusing on many other things so I decided to become a freelancer uh, so I can sort of uh, you know um, prioritize uh, between things which are really important for me. So I actually made my own uh, YouTube sports channel, which called uh, which called Chisto Channel uh, after my, my last name. And I'm making uh, from week to week uh, my almost uh, one hour long sports program. It's called Chisto Sportscast, which is basically a, a YouTube video uh, feature stories about the most famous uh, Hungarian athletes, uh, you know, coaches, uh, uh, I would say Olympic athletes, uh, and also some, some uh, you know, foreigners uh, and foreign athletes as well. Uh, so basically, this is, this is something that is really close to my heart because, you know, this is, I would say, my, my number one field television or the video, video world. But besides it, of course, I'm, I'm doing a, a podcast, which is sort of like radio in a new format. And I'm also writing, you know, I'm, I'm leading one of, uh, I'm, I'm the leader of a sports sports uh, department of a, of a um, 
um, a, a, a weekly magazine, which is also a, something, a, a new project. And besides all that, I'm participating and doing a lot of uh, pro bono work uh, for uh, for uh, all kinds of uh, NGO uh, activities, mostly, uh, you know, helping uh, uh, people less in less fortunate situation. For example, um, the transplanted athletes are really close to my heart and I've been uh, their uh, mentor and also uh, helping them for more than for the, more than a decade by now. It's wonderful. And besides that, we didn't talk about that, that when I when I finished my university studies in the States, later on, I, I decided to uh, uh, extend my studies and I finished University of Law and I specialized myself in, in sports law because I always wanted to sort of uh, get as close uh, to sports from many different aspects as possible. And I also felt that this is something that would be very useful for me. So I basically, I specialize, I have a master's degree in, in, uh, in sports, uh, sports law as well. Uh, even though, you know, my, my first field, as I said, still, still uh, journalism. And through that, you had two, you, you're married. Yes, exactly. You've been divorced and remarried, and yes, and exactly. uh, like me, well, you, it's you, not a secret. I mean, no, that no, that can yeah. happen. And you <laughs> shared with me. You may you may remember this, and we don't need to get off on this topic. But you know, even that was painful because as a, a female, I think uh, we just hold everything on our on our shoulders, you know. And but you, I I think the world of your husband. You married an amazing doctor that actually works with professional athletes and. That's kind of how we met. Um, you're, you've shared with me, and I do want us to touch upon that, how important health and wellness has been to you, not just because your wonderful husband helped your parents and you met him and fell in love through basically a painful experience, but you saw how wonderful he was helping your parents with their health and hungry. Um, and then you have two beautiful boys, correct? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so you've had to juggle a lot while you're doing this. And I, I have to say this, you know, we always say, cause I have children and it's a lot, you feel like you're failing in one area while you're succeeding in another. And it's a constant, you know, battle, but I think that, always. but you're an amazing mother and an amazing wife. And your husband has shared that I've heard him multiple times. So I'd, I'd love to know the secret to that. And I'd love to know how your experience and even the adversity, you know, the hard things you went through um, have made you a better mother and have helped you in your life. I'd love to hear a little bit about your opinion on that, because I know that's a huge part of you. And often when it comes to our careers, we don't talk about that. So I, I would love on, on the show to hear about how you were able to balance that and even maybe, you know, advice you might give other women in that situation. <laughs> Well, yes. Um, thank you, Christina. I mean, uh, I it's it's easy for me because I have role models like you are. So, <laughs> really, it, it is it is something that it, it it's honestly it really helps if you can if you can see uh, other women who who are dedicated mothers, but in the same time, as I said, uh, people who love their profession. And I don't think you know the two things should be you know a, a matter of of choice, either this or that. I mean. What I'm always trying to to say, and I, you know, you are a fantastic example of that too. That it's difficult, of course. It is a lot of, uh, you know, energy, a lot of dedication, uh, very much of, you know, organization. You have to be sort of a, a an artist in that sense. How you yeah. can organize your time and really manage your time. I mean, we always call this time management. How important it is before before I be become a mother and. I, I should. Uh, I suppose you also had the same experience. And never really, we've been, been told that this is going to be one of the most difficult things: time yeah. management. Yeah. How you can do that, yeah. you know? To you know, it's it's it's. Uh, well, <laughs> but but I think it is possible. So uh, what I'm saying is that uh, of course it's difficult. Sometimes you know, I'm 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 losing on uh, mostly on you know my sleeping time. <laughs> yeah. But but uh, in the same time, it gives me so much. It's really you know the source of energy uh, to my heart and to my soul to have uh, you know this kind of support of my husband and of of, of my sons, uh, because you know this is this is basically as I said 
the, the source of everything which is important in my life, uh, mostly. But when I go and do my profession, I, I always feel that I can, I can be relaxed because if I do my thing, then my husband would take care of the boys. Yeah. And if he is concentrating on his work, which I'm absolutely supporting him in, of course, I will be uh, someone who is, you know, do, doing doing the background uh, work. Yeah. So I think th this is always, uh, you know, going like this and that. And sometimes we can, uh, there are certain projects which are we uh, involved together in, and I'm very happy for that. And actually working with professional athletes for him as a doctor and a nutritionist, it was basically my idea. And I was really keen on, uh, uh, you know, to start uh, uh, convincing him to let's try to look over and to take care of the athletes because I, I uh, had uh, from my past some really, really bad experience, you know, how much we did not know about uh, uh, good nutrition and, uh, you know, the sins basically we committed to our bodies because we did it badly. You know, we didn't drink enough. We didn't uh, eat well. We were starving ourselves just to have the competition weight what we needed. And we actually had to suffer the consequences of that. And I told him that if I could help in anything uh, to this generation and these this, uh, professional athletes uh, of, of these, these years, that it would be definitely something to help them to find the best way how they can prepare their body for these kind of huge physical and mental challenges, of course, in the same time. So, uh, and, and from the other hand, which is just as important, uh, for as a mother uh, to to try to find the healthiest way uh, for my family how we can you know uh, feed them and and how we can find the best nutrition uh, for our boys and for ourselves of course we would like to live long we would like to see them grow up we would yeah. be we would like to be you know grandparents even great grandparents if you can make that of course that's the goal <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but as it as you as we say, you know, it really makes a real difference what you eat. I mean, you are what you eat. It's yeah. it's, it's that's the saying, and we we do feel this is this is uh, uh, you know uh, one of the credo of our lives that you have to be very uh, cautious and conscientious about what you what you you know, put into that body uh, that is serving you, you know, 24 hours and, and seven days a week. And as if you're an, an, a professional athlete, of course, it's even more important because then your body is exposed to that kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, physical and, and, and mental and, and stressful situation that uh, you have to prepare your, your, your body, you know, the best way you can. Well, and I, I think that's what led both of us to be part of a founding organization, you know, called the International Science Nutrition Society, so that we can help people with nutrition through science. And I know that I'm very thankful to be working on projects that we will launch at the end of this year with formulas with your husband, actually, um, as one of the scientists and doctors working on that. And I think the value you bring due to your experience, Juja, and your influence and your ability to help people make positive impacts on their life and to speak as an example is huge because I agree with you, not just in your country, but in our country, it used to be the Olympic athletes. We didn't, you know, the nutrition and how it was dealt with. We've come so far but we still have so far to go. And as you know, like you said, the nutrition that you put in your body and what you eat and what you take, it's so important. I don't think people realize, you know, cause we have all these medications, but if you could take care of yourself, right. then you can support your body and, and being healthier and being well. One of the things I like about hungry is I feel like you guys are aware of the GMOs, you are aware of the things that are modified, that the preservatives that aren't good for the body. Um, and I don't know if that's part of your history or why you guys are, are definitely, in, in my opinion, a spokesperson for that and an individual because of his background, not just in medicine, but functional medicine um, and dealing with how to make you know, our machines, our bodies even better so that they can perform in a Absolutely. way. And so that we don't hurt them. 
you know, cause, cause you as an athlete, you shared with me that some of the things you did caused effects on your body later because you were this professional athlete, you know, it, there's wear and tear on your body through that. Absolutely. Basically, I, it, is, it is crucial what you're saying. And I know that uh, uh, mostly the problem when you're a professional athlete that, you know, the time, you know, it, it you know, and, and to be prompt right there at the right moment is so important that sometimes they forget about, you know, uh, the, the effects later on and the consequences later on. So what I'm saying is, you know, this, this is the, you know, the, the easiest to take the pills and to, 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 you know, just have some painkillers and let's go on and let's do that. And nobody really takes care uh, of, of that athlete's uh, long-term, uh, you know, consequences, what is going to be afterwards, how they're going to live their life afterwards, what, what is going to happen to their, you know, uh, uh, body, uh, not just as an athlete, but as a person, you know, I mean, yeah. Come on, I mean, athletics and sport is going to be finishing once in your life, and you still would like to live your life as a healthy, as a healthy person. Of course, if you destroy this machine, then it's going to be a little bit more difficult. So, uh, my mission and our mission uh, together is to to help these these uh, young athletes to to understand, you know, the importance of that uh, that process, uh, how you can help even from a young age. And to, to find, I would say, uh, you know, in a smart way to build up a nutritional plan for you. And it's, it's, it's a very major difference which sport you are in, uh, what period of your competition or, or practice, uh, 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 you know, uh, era you are in, because it always requires a different kind of nutrition. It always makes a major difference, you know, how old you are, how many years you have been in athletics and in sports and, and basically how long you plan your career. So those are the, the, the major uh, bullet points, I think, which a young athlete has to understand in order to help uh, prepare their body for, for these kind of challenges, what, what the, the real uh, Olympic and athletic uh, uh, sport means. And I'm so happy that, that uh, my husband... Um, helps uh, uh, these youngsters and of course not just athletes because he has a lot of patience you know from from the everyday life uh, to 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 make uh, them understand that you know today what I would I would like to uh, emphasize is that like in everything and especially with the online uh, uh, spare which is around in our life there is such a huge noise in nutrition it's so difficult to find, you know, the good path, unless you have scientists like you are, like my husband, and people who are working, you know, with that kind of dedication to help others. So our, our major major goal is and our mission is to, to do it from, from this kind of uh, uh, attitude that we would like to help. You know, sometimes we had bad experience. I had, you know, a lot of uh, from my personal athletic background. So I know how could I, if I could do it a little bit different, I know that my career would have been even longer. Uh, it, it would have been much less pain. It would have been uh, probably easier with much less, less inflammation and all those kind of everyday burden that you have to, uh, you know, sort of handle uh, and, and carry uh, with, with you when you're a professional athlete. So uh, I think in that sense, it's very important that I have a credibility to at least that they believe what I'm saying. I'm saying it because I would like to help. And on my side, there is a scientist and doctor, you know, who is also, as you said, uh, not just a doctor, but, a, you know, he's also uh, involved with functional medicine. And he has a huge experience, uh, you know, with all kinds of different uh, diagnos diagnostical uh, tools and, and uh, uh, with a special system he actually, uh, you know, created and evolved in the last decade, I would say, which is just as important uh, to, to help uh, these people and to make their uh, professional athletic life easier and also, of course uh, uh, some other patients to make their life easier and, and healthier which is the most important after all well I I would like to do another podcast with you when you get back from the Olympics because you're leaving this week next week to to go 
Well, actually, <laughs> I wish you're right. I would love to. I have been in eight Olympics in my life. Yeah, I'm not so old yet. <laughs> so <it's> quite <laughs> a big. <laughs> uh, but this time, uh, I, I I can't go because of the pandemic uh, situation. And uh, as a journalist, you know, uh, basically there is a playbook which makes or uh, I would say work so difficult, almost impossible to meet with athletes. So we decided that it's probably going to be. Uh, the best solution that we are working with big uh, news agencies, uh, you know, uh, basically getting the uh, material and the source of information who are there at Tokyo, and what we are going to do, what we are just exactly doing now, we are going yeah. to have uh, these kind of podcasts and, and Zoom uh, interviews from the Tokyo Olympic Village yeah. and, of course, in the TV studio. So that's the plan at the moment. But actually, my, my uh, uh, contact and my relation with, even today, I met the most famous uh, Hungarian uh, fencer, uh, who is a two-time Olympic champion from the last two Olympics from Rio and from Athens, uh, from, from London, sorry. And uh, he's planning to uh, win the third one in a row, you know, back to back, which is absolutely Absolutely, uh, never ever happened before in this sport, uh, and, and he's a fantastic Hungarian fencer. So, the my I would say my relation uh, to the Olympic athletes is is a very lively. It's in a daily basis. You know, I I really follow uh, their uh, you know their plan uh, about the Tokyo Olympics, and I think it's going to be very exciting. And all I can wish to them, I hope they can they can uh, you know come uh, out very well from this very difficult situation to have the whole Olympic Games in a bubble without spectators. Well, I wish them the best, and I wish you the best. I know you'll be extremely busy during the Olympics, and um, hopefully, I, I'm sure I will have a lot of a lot to tell you about after the Tokyo Olympics. <laughs> so I would love to repeat this and yes. come to our conversation, Christina. I, just I feel like I got to this much <laughs> of the interview about you, and I I want to get to so much more, but. Um, we will get to that at a later time. And I just want to thank you, Zuzha, for how hard you've worked. Um, you're a very strong, admirable woman. And I'm thankful to call you a friend. I love um, the opportunity that we have to help people with nutrition and science. And um, I know it's been a hard life for you, but you've done a phenomenal job. So thank you so much. And thank you, Christina, to, to hear it from you. I mean, it's a real honor, really. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I always miss you. I can't wait till I get to see you soon. Um, and I'm so glad that, that the world's opening up a little bit so we can get back together yeah. soon. I really enjoyed talking to Juja. Science is beautiful, and we in this podcast, Scientifically Beautiful, get to follow people and talk to people that really have made a difference on the science side as well as the just world side. And as you can see with Juja, she has used science to be a better athlete, to be a better mother to be a better wife and to be a better journalist because it's so important to her as far as health and nutrition. And as she shared with you, she's also made it a mission to help other athletes so that they can have better bodies and have a better life. Thanks so much. I hope everyone has a great evening.